reading from Luke chapter 10. Probably read better with some light. Beginning verse 10, it says, But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Let's pray together. Father, tough message. The opposite side of the truth. You love us so much that you've come and died for us to provide the possibility of forgiveness of sin. But what if we reject? And so we have to look at that. Father, I thank you for the way you've placed in the hearts of various people. And uh, certainly Kurt comes to mind this morning, the people that he's met down in Haiti, the sacrifices that they're making to ensure that the word of God is being given out to ensure that those who are there have an opportunity to come to Christ, to see men who have been enslaved to voodoo, people who have been under this influence coming to Christ. Is it worth it to spend the time and the energy and eventually to give your heart a little bit to that place? So, so worth it. Lord, it uh, won't be long and We'll be together around your throne and we'll be thankful for every move we ever made to help someone else come to know you and just about everything else we've done won't mean anything to us at that point in time. So give us the vision. That's your vision, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's a tough message this morning. I really appreciated how Susie read the passage of Scripture she read. I mean, you could almost hear the tears in her voice. And I think we cannot ever speak of the judgment of God without having that kind of heart. We're going to see some of these as we go through the last part of the book of Luke. As Jesus is on the journey to Jerusalem where his life will be taken and then will be resurrected. This is heavy on his heart, the message that it needs to get across, but by now the rejection has become such that he has to begin to speak to what the consequences of the rejection are as well. And so he does that with, I'm sure, a broken heart on his own part. Why do people reject Christ? I think most people reject the Lord because the world rejects him, and the world has more influence on most of us than does God. It's just easier to go that way. It's easier to buy into the idea that it really doesn't matter. And Jesus is trying to help us understand it really matters. It makes a difference. What you believe, what your commitments are. The Bible says, Hebrews 10, 27, it is appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Death is not the end, it is only the beginning. And so the last words that Jesus gives to these 72 as they are about to go out to represent him as we've been looking at this passage has to do with the consequences of rejecting him. He pulls no punches in describing the devastating eternal results that come for those who will not accept him. So as we've looked at this passage, looked at the commission, the challenge, the commands, the conditions, the communication, but this morning, the consequences, the consequences of rejecting Christ are, of course, judgment. Judgment. And so, first of all, the reason for judgment, verse 16. Verse 16, the one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. 
And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. You can't miss it, can you? The word rejects is all the way through the verse. What's the reason for judgment? Rejecting Christ. And notice the linkage that he makes here. This is almost like he creates a chain, right? It goes from God the Father to God the Son to those who are the messengers. And his point is, anywhere along the line that that chain gets broken, then there's a rejection of the truth of the gospel. Two kinds of rejection, direct rejection and indirect. Let's look at the direct rejection, which comprise of three parts. The direct rejection could be rejection of God. Many people just reject God outright, right? The hardcore unbeliever rejects God out of hand. Probably he's going to fall into one of four categories. He may be an atheist, about 7 or 8%, 9% of the population would claim to be atheist. These are people who say there is no God. It's an impossible position intellectually because in order to say there is no anything, you have to be presuppose all knowledge and nobody has all knowledge. And yet, some percentage of the people who live on this world say there is no God. They could be agnostic. This is the belief that we can't know whether there is a God or not. They could be a deist. Most people who are deists don't know that they're a deist. They don't even probably know what the word means, but the word deist believes that while there may be a God who exists, he is irrelevant to us. He perhaps created everything, got it all started, turned it loose, and then let it go. That's deism. Or, and that's typical, typical. I would say most Western people, most people in the Western world are deistic. Pantheism dominates in the Eastern world. Pantheism is the belief that all that is is God and God is all that is. Nature is God, God is nature. There is no personal, self-conscious God. God simply is whatever is. All of these positions reject the self-revelation of God that we have in the Word of God, in the Bible. All of these are contrary to what the Word teaches us, even though they would all use potentially the word God. People who hold any of these positions are like a fellow named Joe. Joe went to the doctor and he said, Doc, I think my wife is losing her hearing. What can I do? The doc said, well, why don't you, you know, we, you need to test and find out how bad this really is. So Joe goes home and his wife is, as he walks in the door, she has her back to him. She's at the stove cooking dinner. And so he walks up about 15 feet behind her and says, honey, what's for dinner? No answer. So he moves up to about 10 feet behind her, and he asks the same question again, no answer. Moves up to five feet behind her, asks the same question, no answer. So he moves up directly behind her and says, honey, what's for dinner? At that point, she turns around completely exaggerated and says, for the fourth time, chicken. We're having chicken for dinner. The problem wasn't Marge. The problem was Joe and beloved. A lot of people are going to say to God one day, you didn't tell me. And God's going to say, oh no, I told you, you just weren't listening. Do you ever wonder why as you go through the Bible, it keeps saying, Hear, hear, hear. He who has ears to hear. How many times did Jesus say that? In the Old Testament, it's listen, hear, listen, hear. Why? Because people are not listening. And God will say, I've revealed myself to you in creation, in nature. How can you look at the expanse of the universe, the vastness of the universe, and then look at what's inside of a tiny atom that's so tiny you can't even see it, nor can anyone ever see it, to this day with the microscopes we have, and yet there's a whole universe going around in there. How can you look at all of that and say, just happen, just happen? I've revealed myself in nature. He will say, I have revealed myself in your self-conscience, in your sense of morality, 
in your love for beauty and for music, where does that come from an evolutionary scheme? It's not explainable. I have revealed myself. I have revealed myself in the Word. I have given you a verifiable, written, permanent record. I have revealed myself. And then he will say what he says in Hebrews 1. Though I've revealed myself to you in the former times through the prophets and all the rest of that, I've revealed myself to you now in the ultimate sense in the person of my own son, Jesus Christ. You have only to look at him and you are seeing God in the flesh. The problem isn't that God hasn't spoken, beloved. The problem is that we're not listening. Imagine dying and finding yourself face to face with an omnipotent, omniscient, holy God that you have denied and rejected. That will be the fate of all those who have denied God and rejected Christ. He says this in Romans 1. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth Why do they suppress the truth? Because of their unrighteousness. They prefer their unrighteousness to the truth of God. They have suppressed the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. He's shown it to them in in nature, in their conscience, in his word, and in Christ. And sure and certain judgment awaits those who have rejected God. You can get by with it in this life. You cannot get by with it in eternity. That's the first link in the chain. What's the second? It's rejection of Jesus. Rejection of Jesus. Many people believe in God. They have certain faith in God. They would say, yes, I believe there is a God. And they may even accept Jesus as a good man, a wonderful prophet, Someone who walked on the earth and did a lot of good things, but is God? No, no way. Can't believe that. As a substitute for their sin on the cross? No, they want a God that they can control. They want a God who is, who is by their definition. As a loving side, he has no wrath side. He has no hatred of sin. He has no, there's no accountability. They don't want a God who came and took the penalty for their sin upon himself and now requires that they submit to his lordship. They don't want that. God, they don't want Jesus. The problem is you can't have the Father without the Son. You can't have God without Jesus. You can't have the Bible without substitutionary Atonement. I know this is an unpopular message. I'm very aware of that. But this is the message of the Bible. It's the only truth that we have coming from the outside of our human existence in. And here's what the Bible says over and over. John 1, 11 and 12. He came into his own and his own people did not receive him. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who believed in his name. Who are the children of God? Everybody? No. Only those who by faith have accepted him as the penalty for their sin. Those are the children of God. John 3, verse 35 and 36, the Father loves the Son. This is Jesus speaking. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. God and Jesus are inextricably bound together. You cannot have the one without the other. You cannot separate them. 1 John 5 Beginning in verse 9, Jesus or John says this. He says, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. 
For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Could God make it any more clear? The musical Jesus Christ Superstar, Mary Magdalene, which is, which is, by the way, a tool of Satan to discredit the Lord. There are many of those, and this is one of them. Mary Magdalene sings the song, he's, only, he's a man, he's only a man. The real Mary Magdalene would never have sung that song. A man doesn't go around forgiving people's sins, people who have never sinned against him personally, like Jesus did. A mere man wouldn't go along encouraging people to worship him and then accepting that worship like Jesus did. A mere man could not go around doing the mighty miracles that Jesus did, casting out demons, raising people from the dead. A mere man can't do those things. The historical record of Jesus, beloved, will not stand the foolishness of the assertion that he's just a man. He's much more. C.S. Lewis contends the doctrine of Christ's divinity seems to me not something stuck on which you can unstick, but something that peeps out at every point so that you would have to unravel the whole web to get rid of it. What he's saying is the record of Christ is such that if you take the divinity out of it, you have nothing left. We either have to accept him as God, or we have to throw out the whole Bible. You can't just have a tame Jesus who is this nice guy that you'd like to be friends with. We either accept him as the God that he is, or we reject him and come under judgment. There's a third link in the chain, and that is the rejection of the messengers. Verse 16, the one who rejects you, that's the messenger. If you're a believer, the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. When we are faithfully representing the gospel, beloved, and people turn away, they are not so much rejecting us as they are rejecting God. I know that hurts, I know it's painful at times, but that's part of the process when we belong to him. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.8, he says, therefore, whoever disregards this, meaning his teaching, Paul's teaching, disregards not man, but God. People reject the gospel message because they don't like the person giving it. You know, he parts his hair wrong, he's not cool, whatever the problem may be. It's too square. They are really rejecting God. They're like, you know what, they're like the telemarketer called. You know, he, got, he called his home. A little voice came on the phone and he said, uh, could I speak to your, could I speak to your mom or dad? The little girl didn't even seem to understand. He, she just started giving him a tour of the house. You know, I, I see a book. I see a table. I see a refrigerator. But soon the father picked up the phone and he came on the phone and he said, I'm sorry, can I help you? And the guy says, oh, yes. He says, I think I can help you. He says, I'm from the ABC phone company. Any of you ever get this call? And uh, I, want, I wonder, what's your, what's your long distance rate? I'm sure I can improve on it. Father said, hang on just a second. Pretty soon a little voice came on the phone and said, I see a lamp. I see a couch. I see a front door. Dad hung up on the telemarketer. That's the same as people do when they reject God's messenger. They're hanging up on the only truth that there is in the world. So the reason for judgment, rejecting Christ. How about indirect rejection? 
It's in this passage, indirect rejection. This is the most popular way of all, I think, to reject Christ. Do nothing. Do nothing. If you do absolutely nothing, that's all you have to do to reject Christ. Look at verse 15. This is, this is I, to my way of thinking, this is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Verse 15. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You should be brought down to Hades. That's a staggering statement. Capernaum, as most of you know, was where Jesus had moved at the beginning of his ministry. So it was his hometown. That's where Jesus was now headquartered for two and a half years. For two and a half years, the greatest preaching in the history of the world was going on in Capernaum. For two and a half years, the greatest miracles in the history of the world were going on in Capernaum. Miracles were everywhere. And Jesus says, Capernaum, I know you think you're going to heaven, but you're not. You're going to hell. He didn't mince words, did he? He said, you're going to hell. Why? Because they didn't accept him. Close wasn't good enough. He was right there. The Son of God was right there for two and a half years. And it wasn't the, two and a half, it wasn't the you know, 30 years when he was a carpenter, and you might have said, well, okay, he was close, but he wasn't exactly in the ministry that he had later. Now he is actively representing God the Father. He's right there among them. The Son of God is there, living, eating, drinking, breathing, sweating, doing his laundry, and by the way, preaching. But close isn't good enough. It didn't save them because they rejected him for who he was. Jesus' hometown, Nazareth, remember in Luke 4? Remember what they did? They rode him out of town on a rail. Remember that? When he started preaching, they said, we don't want any of this. They tried to throw him over a cliff and kill him. But Capernaum didn't kick him out. They were just coolly indifferent. I think in Capernaum, they loved the spectacle, you know? Jesus came into town, and man, there was excitement every day that he was there, that he wasn't out on the road somewhere. They loved the publicity. They loved the spectacle. They loved, undoubtedly, the business that the crowds brought into town when Jesus was there, and they loved to go see it all. It was better than TV. I mean, look, think what you could go out and see. It was wonderful. But through benign neglect, they rejected the message. They rejected his lordship, and all they did was nothing. scenario that plays out in churches around the world every day. People so close and yet so far. People who have the truth. I mean, we worry about and we think about, what about those who've never heard about Jesus Christ? What about those who don't know the gospel? Beloved, we should worry about them. We should pray about them. But we should be more worried about those who know and are not doing anything about it. Close. But so far, Dr. Paul, Paul Carlson was a, he was a medical missionary in, in the Congo in 1964 when the, you know, the Civil War broke out there. And for some reason, he and a bunch of other missionaries who were there at the time were targeted by the rebels. And they were hunkered down in a particular ha house as the rebels were coming for them but they finally decided their only hope was to make a break for safety that lay just kind of beyond a wall in the compound. They figured if they could get over that, they could run further and they would not be followed because there were other troops out there if they could get that far, government troops. And so they decided to go. They took off running, shots rang out. One of them was hit and fell dead immediately. The rest of them got to the wall. They clambered to the top and climbed over the other side. Dr. Carlson was the last one. He climbed to the top of the wall. He was about to jump to the other side and a shot rang out, hit him, and killed him instantly. So close, but yet so far. You, you know, does it strike you? It would almost be better not to be so close. 
Being close didn't help at all. He was still just as dead as if he'd been shot at the beginning. It's just that those of his loved ones and those who knew him could only think, oh, he was so close. I like the people who make it to church every week, but they're just going through the motions. They're just counting on the ritual. They're just counting on the baptism certificates, something else. They're surrounded by truth, but never surrendering to the Lord of truth. It's a surrender, beloved. It's putting up the white flag and saying, you're in charge now, not me. Close doesn't count, not in Capernaum, not in the Congo, not in Eaton, Colorado. Close doesn't cut it. To be close is to, be, is to still be under condemnation. And even as those in, even as those in uh, Capernaum were being eul eulogized at their funeral, they were beginning an eternity separated from God. Indirect rejection, do nothing. Well, what about the reality of judgment? Is it really real? Jesus made no bones about it, but I think if you talk to most of our culture today, they would say, there's no hell. Who's so foolish as to believe that? Nobody believes that anymore. We know better. And so we live in a culture which is in complete denial about this. Society tells us, oh, if you have some sin, it's not your fault. You can blame someone else. Our psychologists and psychiatrists tell us it was your parents. It was your fifth grade teacher. It was, you know, somebody. There's somebody back there. Perhaps your spouse. You know. Somebody's causing your sin. Think that God would condemn you Hold you accountable for the sin that's the fault of somebody else? Surely we know this is all unthinkable. But Jesus didn't think it was unthinkable, beloved. It's us who are in denial. The one who came from eternity to what he said to Pilate, Pilate asked him, why did you come? He said, I came to bring truth. That one who should know because he came from eternity and he went back to eternity says there is a judgment coming. Jesus left no doubt about the reality of this. Judgment is coming and it's real and it will be meaningful and some will be saved and most won't. It says in verse 13, <clears throat> woe to you, Chorazin, well, to you, Bethsaida, these were neighboring villages to Capernaum, places where Jesus also ministered. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable than the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you and you, Capernaum. When you be exalted to heaven, you will be brought down to Hades. Jesus kind of playing hardball here, isn't he? Tyre and Sidon, as most of you know, were, were, were villages, major cities actually, on the, on the coast of the Mediterranean, Phoenician cities. In the Old Testament, they were, they, were, they were known for their sinfulness. They were probably along with Sodom, the, the primary, not the only, but the primary examples of extreme sinfulness. They were known as sin city to the, to the Jewish people. And all three of those cities had been judged by God after God prophesied it would happen. Do you see how God is trying to get our attention? He's, he's saying, listen to me. And, and if you need an example, here he is. I'm going to destroy Sodom, he says in Genesis 18. And then in Genesis 19, guess what? He destroys Sodom, just like he said. What's his point? Judgment is real. He tells in Ezekiel 26 and 27 in graphic detail how Tyre and Sidon are gonna be destroyed. And it isn't very many years later, in the next 300 years, two men, Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander the Great, who are well known to history, fulfilled the prophecies in Ezekiel 26 and 27 to the letter. What is Jesus and what is God trying to say? He's trying to say it's real. Just look. Just listen. Judgment is real. And now Jesus turns around and says, you remember those cities, Tyre and Sidon? I have news for you. If they had seen what you've seen, and if they had heard what you've heard, 
if they had had the gospel that I've brought to you, they would have repented. It's going to be better for them in the judgment than it is for you because they would have repented. They wouldn't be asking for more signs and being coolly indifferent like you are. Now, I think it's very important that we note this, beloved. It's not just anybody making this pronouncement. Who is it making this pronouncement? You say, well, it's Jesus. Well, that's right. But guess what else? It's the one who's going to be the judge at the judgment. Because later, Jesus says this in John 5.22. He says, the Father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son. So who's going to judge the living and the dead? Jesus is. There's a good reason for that. He's going to do that because nobody's going to be able to come up to Jesus and say, you didn't know what it was like. He knows exactly what it was like. In the words of Hebrews, he was tested in all points like as we are yet without sin. Not going to be able to have that excuse before the judge of all time. Jesus is going to be the judge, and the judge who is the one who's going to judge us says it's coming. If you don't turn from your sin, judgment is coming, and I should know I'm going to be the one who's going to be the judge. Listen, if you're in the Olympics, and you're, uh, I don't know, an ice skater or a, a gymnast, wouldn't it be some advantage to know the judge? I don't mean to pay him off, but at least you get, or that might help too, I don't know, but it seemed like it apparently did a few times, but mostly what you'd want to know, well, what are you looking for? What, what do you want to see, right? What, what is it that would be important for me to know? Well, the one who is the judge of all time, the judge of our eternal existence is the one who is saying, if you reject me, it's judgment. Judgment is coming. So what must we do? The judge answers that question. Matthew, it's Turn there, we're going to see it in Luke 2, but in Matthew 7, it tells us in simple terms what needs to happen. It's not, not the only place, but he says this in Matthew 7. He says, verse 13, Matthew 7, verse 13, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Jesus makes the point that the way is narrow. Why? Because there's only one way. It's the person of Christ. We must know him. He says it's easy to go down that narrow way. I mean, that wide way. Why? Because that's what you were born on and that's the direction you're headed. And if you you do nothing, you just stay on it. You have to make a decision to repent of your sins and to turn to him in order to get on the narrow way that leads to life. And he's telling us, you know what? There's going to be a lot more people on the broad way than there are in the narrow way, unfortunately. It should break our heart that that's the case, but that's what he says. How about the realm of judgment? One more thing, the realm of judgment. Jesus spells it out in one word. Hades, hell. Judgment leads to hell. It's a place of eternal torment, separated from God, the presence of God. The Bible speaks of it in terms of fire. You know, whether it's literal fire or not, it certainly represents suffering and torment. I think primarily twofold. We'll see this when we get a little further in Luke because Jesus isn't going to leave this topic alone. It was a lot more detail highlighted in Luke 16, but I think two main things. The first is the, first is the awful loss of all hope of any communication with God, any communion with God. That's going to be the worst part of hell. There's now no God to commune with. There's no God to be in touch with. There's no God to be in a relationship with. The second thing is an eternity of regret. Eternity of regret. Later on, we'll see why I say that, but I believe that regret is going to be at the heart of the suffering that goes on for those who have rejected Christ. The great 
Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper said it this way. He said, would you know what makes heaven heaven? It is communion with God. That's what it is. It's not the golden streets and the wonderful mansion and all that stuff. It's going to be with God. It's what you were made for. Would you know what makes hell hell? It is the forsakenness of God. Jesus believed in hell, and he came from a position of knowing what he was talking about, right? He does tell us it wasn't originally intended for people. Speaking of his own second coming, Jesus says in Matthew 25, verse 41, says, then he, the son of man, talking about himself, he will say to those on his left, in his second coming, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his Angels, note two things. First, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's, that's where it first had to come from. The punishment for those who, knowing God, being in a relationship with God, chose against him with full knowledge of everything that they were doing, and it was prepared for them. But second, notice that people who reject Christ are being sent there. Judgment, beloved, is real. You can deny it all you want. You can put it on the back burner. You can say it can't be as bad as the Bible says but you are now going against the truth that God chose to do, to give us. And I want you to notice one other thing. Those, everybody kind of gets what they, what they ask for in the end. Those who reject Christ have been asking for no communion with God. And in the end, what's God going to say? Okay, here's an eternity worth of no communion with God. We get what we choose. Now, there's a minor point here, and I'm not going to take time on it today because we'll come to it later, but notice there are degrees of punishment in hell. Jesus says here it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Those who have more light will have greater punishment. It's far worse to live in the United States and to come to church every week and reject Christ than it would be to live as a pagan somewhere where you don't hear the word of Christ. That's a huge, terrible warning. But there are degrees of punishment in hell. We'll talk about it more later. The point is hell is very real in the mind of Christ. You know, I'm not a big fan of Bishop Sheen, for those of you who can remember the days when he used to be on television, but I'll tell you, he had one thing right. A heckler said to him one time, he asked him a question about somebody who had died. And Sheen said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll ask, him when I get, I'll ask him about it when I get to heaven. And the heckler said, well, what if he's not in heaven? And Sheen said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> and the heckler said, well, I, I don't believe in hell either. And Sheen said, you will when you get there. You will when you get there. Oh. To wake up in hell and discover the reality of it at that point. Beloved, don't let that happen. Don't let it happen. God has told us about it for the sake that we would come to him and ask his forgiveness. He's told us about it so that we could be warned. All we have to do to go there is nothing. Here's a question. Let me ask you a question in conclusion. Three frogs are sitting on a log. It's not funny yet. <laughs> Two of them decide to jump off. How many are left? You say one. But that would be wrong. Well, three of them are still left. You see, to decide to jump and to actually jump are two different things, right? And to believe that Jesus was a guy who existed and to believe that there was a physical presence on earth by that name and to believe that he did a lot of good things and to think even maybe to decide that someday I, I may accept him as Lord, someday I, I may do that, you're still sitting on the log. All I have to do to come under the judgment of God is nothing. I urge you to do something come to Christ. Confess your sin. Turn your life over to him. 
Give up your life for the eternal life that he offers. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. This is, these are not, certainly not my favorite sermons to preach and probably not our favorite sermons to hear. But Lord, we would not be faithful to your truth if we didn't speak it as you did. You weren't shy about it because you wanted us to come to you. We, you wanted us to know the repercussions if we refused. So, Lord, open hearts to yourself right now. I pray that if there's anyone here, sitting here, who doesn't know you, the quietness of their own heart right now, as you call them, as you pull them, that they would open their heart and say, yes, I see that I am a, I'm a sinner, just like everybody else I know. And, I, I, I see my need of salvation. I ask you, Lord, to, to be my Lord. I thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for paying the penalty that I could not pay. I accept you as my Savior and as my Lord. I want to be a child of God. That's what I want to be. Thank you that you would never turn anyone away, Father, who would come with that prayer in their heart. And so I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.